Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe, Section 12. Miscellaneous, Moon's Phases. It's been shown that the Moon is not a reflector of the Sun's light, but is self-luminous. That the luminosity is confined to one half of its surface is sufficiently shown by the fact that, quote, New Moon, the whole circle or outline of the Moon is often distinctly visible but the darker outline is less, or the circle is smaller than the segment which is illuminated. From this, it is easily seen that the quote-unquote new moon, or full moon, or gibbous moon, are but the different proportions of the illuminated surface which are presented to the observer on Earth. The moon's appearance, astronomers have indulged their imagination to such a degree that the moon has been considered to be a solid, opaque, spherical world having mountains and valleys, lakes and volcanoes, craters and other conditions analogous to the surface of the earth. So far has this fancy been carried that the whole visible disk has been mapped out and special names given to its various peculiarities as though they had been carefully observed and measured by a party of terrestrial ordnance surveyors. All this has been done in direct opposition to the fact that whoever looks, without previous bias, through a powerful telescope at the moon's surface will be puzzled to say what is really like or how to compare it with anything known. The, compar the comparison which may be made will depend greatly upon the state of mind of the observer. It is well known that persons looking through the looking at the rough bark of a tree or at the irregular lines or veins in certain kinds of marble and stone, or gazing at the red embers in a dull fire, will, according to the degree of activity of the imagination, be able to see different forms, even the outlines of animals and human faces. It is in this way that persons may fancy that the moon's surface is broken up into hills and valleys, and other arrangements such as are found on the earth. But anything really similar to the surface of our own world is anywhere visible upon the moon is altogether fallacious. This is admitted by some of those who have written upon the subject, quote, some persons when they look into a telescope for the first time, having heard that mountains are to be seen and discovered, discovering nothing but these previously described unmeaning figures, break off in disappointment and have their faith in these things rather diminished than increased. I would advise, therefore, before the student takes even his first view of the moon through a telescope, to form as clear an idea as he can how mountains and valleys and caverns situated at such a distance ought to look, and by what marks they may be recognized. Let him seize, if possible, the most favorable periods about the time of the first quarter, and previously learn from drawings and explanations how to interpret everything he sees, end quote. Quote, whenever we exhibit celestial objects to inexperienced observers, it is usual to precede the view with good drawings of the objects, accompanied by an explanation of what each appearance exhibited in the telescope indicates. The novice is told that mountains and valleys can be seen in the moon by the aid of a telescope, but on looking he sees a confused mass of light and shade, and nothing which looks to him either like mountains or valleys. Had his attention been previously directed to a plain drawing of the moon, and each particular appearance interpreted to him, he would then have looked through the telescope with intelligence and satisfaction." End quote. These quotes coming from Mechanism of the Heavens by Denison Olmsted, LLD, Professor of Natural Philosophy and Astronomy in Gale College, U.S. Also, Mitchell's Orbs of Heaven, page 232. Thus, it is admitted by those who teach that the moon is a spherical world, having hills and dales like the earth, can only see such things in imagination. Quote, nothing but unmeaning figures, end quote, are really visible, and quote, the students break off in disappointment and have their faith in such things rather diminished than increased, until they previously learned from drawings and explanations how to interpret everything seen. End quote. But who first made such drawings? Who first interpreted the, quote, unmeaning figures and the confused mass of light and shade? End quote. Who first declared them to indicate mountains and valleys, and ventured to make drawings and give explanations and interpretations for the purpose of biasing the minds and fixing or guiding the imaginations of subsequent observers? Whoever they were, they at least had given the reins to fancy 
and afterwards took upon themselves to dogmatize and teach their crude and unwarranted imaginings to succeeding investigators. And this is the kind of evidence and reasoning which is obtruded in our seats of learning and spread out in the numerous works which are published for the edification of society. The planet Neptune, for some years the advocates of the Earth's rotundity and of the Newtonian philosophy in general, were accustomed to refer with an air of pride and triumph to the discovery of a new planet which was called Neptune as an undeniable evidence of the truth of their system or theory. The existence of this luminary was said to have been predicated from calculation only and for a considerable period before it had been seen by the telescope. It was urged that, therefore, the system which would permit of such a discovery must therefore be true. But the whole matter subsequently proved to be unsatisfactory. That a proper conception may be formed of the actual value of the calculations and their supposed verification, the following account will be useful. In the year 1781, on March 13th, Uranus was discovered by Sir William Herschel, who was examining some small stars near the feet of Gemini and he observed one of them to have sensible amount of diameter and less brightness than the others, and it was soon found to be a planet. It, however, had been seen before first by Flamstead on December 23, 1690, and between this time and 1781 it had been observed 16 times by Flamstead, Bradley, Mayer, and Lemonier. These astronomers had classed it as a star of the sixth magnitude. Between 1781 and 1820, it was, of course, very frequently observed, and it was hoped that at the latter time sufficient data existed to construct accurate tables of its motions. This task was undertaken by M. Bavard, member, de l'Académie de Sciences, but he met with unforeseen difficulties. It was found utterly impossible to construct tables which would represent the 17 ancient observations and at the same time the more numerous modern ones and it was finally concluded that the ancient observations were erroneous or that some strange and unknown action disturbed or had disturbed the planet consequently mr bavard discarded entirely the old observations and used only those taken between seventeen eighty one and eighteen twenty in constructing the tables of uranus for some years past it has been found that the tables thus constructed do not agree any better with modern observations than they do with the ancient observations consequently it was evident that the planet was under the influence of some unknown cause several hypotheses have been suggested as to the nature of this cause some persons talked of a resisting medium others of a great satellite which might accompany uranus some even went so far as to suppose that the vast distance of Uranus from the Sun caused the law of gravitation to lose some of its force. Others thought that the rapid flight of a comet had disturbed the regular movements. Others thought of the existence of a planet beyond Uranus whose disturbing force caused the anomalous motions of the planet. But no one did otherwise than follow the bent of his inclination and did not support his assertion by any positive considerations. Quote, Thus was the theory of Uranus surrounded with difficulties when M. Le Verrier, Verrier, an eminent French mathematician, undertook to investigate the irregularities in its motions. His first paper appeared on the 10th of November, 1845, and second on June 1st, 1846, published in the Comte Rendois. In his second paper, after a most elaborate and careful investigation, he proves the utter incompatibility of any of the preceding hypotheses to account for the planet's motions, except only that of the last one, viz., that of a new planet. He then successfully proves that this planet cannot be situated either between the Sun and Saturn, or between Saturn and Uranus, but that it must be beyond Uranus. And, in this paper, he asks the following questions. Quote, is it possible that the irregularities of Uranus can be owning to the action of a planet situated in the ecliptic at a distance of twice the mean distance of Uranus from the Sun? If so, where is it actually situated? What is its mass? What are the elements of the orbit it describes? End quote. This was the problem he set himself to work upon by means of solving the inverse problem of the perturbations. 
for instead of having to measure the action of a determined planet, he had to deduce the elements of the orbit of the disturbing planet and its place in the heavens from the recognized inequalities of Uranus. And this problem M. Le Verrier has successfully solved. In his second paper, he deduces the place in the heavens that the body must be at as 325 degrees of the heliocentric longitude. On the 31st August, he published his third paper. In this, he has calculated that the period of the planet is 217 years and that it moves in an orbit at the distance of more than 3,000 millions of miles from the Sun, that its mean longitude on January 1st, 1847 will be 318 degrees 17 minutes, its true longitude 326 degrees 32 minutes, and that the longitude of its perelion will be 284 degrees 45 minutes, that it will appear to have a diameter of three and one quarter seconds of arc as seen from the Earth, and that it is now about five degrees east of Delta Capricorni. Quote, These remarkable calculations have pointed out a position which has very nearly proved to be the true one. On September 23rd, Dr. Gall at Berlin discovered a star of the eighth magnitude which has proved to be the planet. Its place at the time was five degrees from Delta Capricorni. It was found to have a disk of three seconds, as predicted, and its longitude at the time differs less than a degree from the longitude computed from the above elements. Its daily motion, too, is found to agree very closely with the predicted, and judging from the last circumstance, the planet's distance, as stated above, must be nearly the truth. Thus, the result of these calculations was the discovery of a new planet in the place assigned to it by theory, whose mass, distance, position in the heavens, and orbit it describes around the sun were all approximately determined before the planet had ever been seen. And all agrees with observations so far as can at present be determined. It is found to have a disk and its diameter cannot be much less than 40,000 miles, and may be more. Its motions are very slow. It is at present in the constellation of Aquarius, as indicated by theory, and it will be in the constellation of Capricornus all the year 1847. It may be readily seen in the telescope of moderate power. Whatever view we take from this noble discovery, it is most gratifying whether at the addition of another planet to our list, whether at the proving the correctness of the theory of universal gravitation, or in what view soever it must be considered as a splendid discovery, and the merit is chiefly due to theoretical astronomy. This discovery is perhaps the greatest triumph of astronomical science that has ever been recorded. End quote. If such things as criticism, experience, and comparative observation did not exist, the tone of exaltation in which the above article indulges might be properly shared in by the astronomical student. But let the following extracts be carefully read, and it will be seen that such a tone is premature and unwarranted. Quote, Paris, September 15, 1848. The only sittings of the Academy of late, in which there was anything worth recording, and even this was not of a practical character, were those of the 29th Ult and the 11th Inst. On the former day, M. Babinet made a communication respecting that planet Neptune, which has been generally called M. Le Verrier's planet. The discovering of it has, as it was said, been made by him from the theoretical deductions which astonished and delighted the scientific public. What M. Le Verrier had inferred from the action on other planets of some body which ought to exist was verified, at least so it was thought at the time by actual vision. Neptune was actually seen by other astronomers, and the honor of the theorist of, obtained additional luster. But it appears from a communication of M. Babinet that this is not the planet of M. La Verrier. He had placed his planet at a distance. These quotes were coming from Illustrated London Almanac for 1847. He had placed his planet at a distance from the sun equal to 36 times the limit of the terrestrial orbit. Neptune revolves around at a distance equal to 30 times of these limits, 
which makes a difference of nearly 200 million of leagues. M. Le Verrier had assigned to his planet a body equal to 38 times of that of the Earth. Neptune has only one-third of its volume. M. Le Verrier had stated the revolutions of his planet round the sun to take place in 217 years. Neptune performs its revolutions in 166 years. Thus then, Neptune is not M. Le Verrier's planet, and all his theory as regards to that planet falls to the ground. M. Le Verrier may find another planet, but it will not answer the calculations which he had made for Neptune. In the sitting of the 14th, M. Le Verrier noticed the communication of M. Babinet and to a great extent admitted his own error. He complained indeed that much of what he said was taken in too absolute a sense, but he evinces much more candor than might have been expected from a disappointed explorer. M. Le Verrier may console himself with the reflection that if he has not been so successful as he thought he had been, others might have been equally unsuccessful, and as he has still before him an immense field for the exercise of observation and calculation, we may hope that he will soon make some discovery which will remove the vexation of his present disappointment. End quote. As the data of Le Verrier and Adams were stand at present there is a discrepancy between the predicted and the true distance and in some other elements of the planet it remains therefore for these or future astronomers to reconcile theory with fact or perhaps in the case of uranus to make the new planet the means of leading to yet greater discoveries it would appear from the most recent observations that the mass of neptune instead of being as at first stated one 9,300 as only 123 thousandth that of the sun. Whilst this periodic time is now given with a greater probability at 166 years and its mean distance from the sun nearly 30, Let Verrier gave the mean distance from the sun 36 times that of the earth and the period of revolution 217 years. Quote, May 14, 1847. A paper was read before the Royal Astronomical Society by Professor Shoemaker on the identity of planet Neptune, M. La Verrier's, with a star observed by M. Lalande in May 1795. End quote, end quote. This quote is coming from Times newspaper, Monday, September 8, 1848. Also Cosmos by Humboldt, page 75. Report of Royal Astronomical Society for February 11, 1848. Number 4, Volume 8. Such mistakes as the above ought to at least make the advocates of the Newtonian theory less positive and more ready to acknowledge that at best their system is but hypothetical and must sooner or later give place to a philosophy the premises of which are demonstrable and which is in all its details sequent and consistent. Pendulum experiments as proofs of Earth's motion. In the early part of the year 1851, the scientific journals and nearly all the newspapers published in Great Britain and on the continents of Europe and America were occupied in the recording and discussing of certain experiments. With the pendulum first made by M. Foucault of Paris, and the public were startled by the announcement that the results furnished a practical proof of the Earth's rotation. The subject was referred to in the Literary Gazette in the following words, quote, Everybody knows what is meant by a pendulum in its simplest form, a weight hanging by a thread to a fixed point. Such was the pendulum experimented upon long ago by Galileo, who discovered the well-known law of isochronous vibrations applicable to the same. The subject has since received a thorough examination, as well as theoretical as practical form, from mathematicians and engineers, and yet, strange to say, the most remarkable feature of the phenomenon has remained unobserved, and wholly unsuspected until within the last few weeks, when a young and promised French physicist, M. Foucault, who was induced by certain reflections to repeat Galileo's experiments in the cellar of his mother's house at Paris, succeeded in establishing the existence of a fact connected with it which gives an immediate and visible demonstration of the Earth's rotation. 
Suppose the pendulum already described to be set moving in a vertical plane from north to south. The plane in which it vibrates to ordinary observation would appear to be stationary. M. Foucault, however, has succeeded in showing that this is not the case, but that the plane itself slowly moving around the fixed point as a center in a direction contrary to the Earth's rotation with the apparent heavens from east to west. His experiments have since been repeated in the Hall of Observatory under the superintendence of M. Arago and fully confirmed. If a pointer be attached to the weight of a pendulum suspended by a long and fine wire capable of turning round in all directions and nearly in contact with the floor of a room, the line which this pointer appears to trace on the ground and which may easily be followed by a chalk mark will be found to be slowly but visibly and constantly moving round like the hand of a watch dial and the least consideration will show that this ought to be the case and will excite astonishment that so simple a consequence as this is of the most elementary laws of geometry and mechanics should so long have remained unobserved. Note, the subject has created a great sensation in the mathematical and physical circles of Paris. It is proposed to obtain permission from the government to carry on further observations by means of a pendulum suspended from the dome of the Pantheon, length of suspension being a desideratum in order to make the result visible on a larger scale and secure greater con constancy and duration in the experiment. The time required for the performance of a complete revolution of the plane of vibration would be about 32 hours 8 minutes for the parallel of Paris, 30 hours 40 minutes for that of London, and at 30 degrees from the equator exactly 48 hours. Certainly anyone who should have proposed not many weeks back to prove the rotation of the earth upon which we stand by means of direct experiment made upon its surface would have run the risk with the mob of gentlemen who wrote upon mechanics of being thought as mad as if he were to have proposed reviving Bishop Wilkins's notable plan for going to the North American colonies in a few hours by rising in a balloon from the earth and gently floating in the air until the earth in its diurnal rotation have turned the desired quarter towards the suspended aeronaut whereupon as gently to descend so necessary and wholesome is it occasionally to reconsider the apparently simplest and best established conclusions of science End quote. the following is seen from scotsman which has always been distinguished for the accuracy of its scientific papers the article bears the initials cm which will at once be recognized as those of mr charles mclarlin for many years, the accomplished editor of that journal, quote, the beautiful experiment contrived by M. Foucault to demonstrate the rotation of the globe has deservedly excited universal interest. Note, a, de a desire has always been felt that some method could be devised of rendering this rotation palpable to the senses. Even the illustrious Laplace participated in this feeling and has left it on record. Quote, although he says the rotation of the earth is now established with all the certainty which the physical sciences require still a direct proof of that phenomenon ought to interest both geometricians and astronomers no man ever knew the laws of the planetary motions better than Laplace and before penning such a sentence it is probable that he had turned the subjects in his mind and without discovering any process by which the object could be attained but it does not follow that if he had applied the whole force of his genius to the task, he would have not succeeded. Be this as it may, here we have the problem solved by a man not probably possessing a tithe of his science or talent, and, what is very remarkable, after the discovery was made, it is found to be legitimately deducible from mathematical principles. And note, in this, as in many other cases, the fact comes first and takes us by surprise, after which we find that we had long been in possession of the principles from which it flowed, and that with the clue we had in our hands, theory should have revealed the fact to us long before. M. Foucault's communication describing his experiments in the Comte Randu of the Academy of Sciences for 3rd February 1851 his first experiments were made with a pendulum only two meters at six feet 
six and a quarter inches in length, consisting of a steel wire from six tenths to eleven tenths of a millimeter in diameter. The millimeter is the twenty-fifth part of an inch, to the lower end of which was attached a polished brass ball weighing five kilograms or eleven English pounds. Note, a metallic point projecting below the ball and so directed as if formed a continuation of the suspension wire served as an index to mark the change of position more precisely. The pendulum hung from a steel plate in such a manner as to move freely in any vertical plane. To start the oscillatory movement without giving the ball to any bias, it was drawn to one side with a cord which held the ball by a loop. The cord was then burned after which the loop fell off and the vibrations generally generally limited to an arc of 15 or 20 degrees commenced. In one minute the ball had sensibly deviated from the original plane of vibration towards the observer's left. Afterwards he experimented on the observatory with a pendulum 11 meters or 30 feet long and laterally at the Pantheon with one still longer. The advantage of a large pendulum as compared with a small one is that a longer time elapses before it comes to a state of rest, for machinery cannot be employed here as in a clock to continue the motion. The pendulum is suspended over the center of a circular table whose circumference is divided into the degrees and minutes. The vibrations are begun in the manner above described and in a short time it is observed that the pendulum instead of returning to the same point of the circle from which it started has shifted to the left. If narrowly observed, the change in the plane of vibration, says M. Foucault, is perceptible in one minute and in a half an hour. Quote, il asante a you, end quote, it is quite palpable. At Paris, in the change exceeds 11 degrees in an hour. Thus, supposing the oscillations to commence in a plane directed south and north, in two hours the oscillations will point south-southwest and north-northeast. In four hours they will point southwest and northeast. And in eight hours the oscillations will point due east and west or at right angles to their original direction. To a spectator the changes seem to be in the pendulum, which without any visible cause has shifted round a quarter of a circle. But the real change is in the table, which resting on the earth and accompanying it in its rotation has performed a fourth and something more of its diurnal revolution. No one anticipated such a result, and the experiment has been received by some with incredulity, by all with wonderment, and one source of the incredulity arises from the difficulty of conceiving how amidst the 10,000 experiments of which the pendulum has been the subject, so remarkable a fact could have escaped notice so long. Fully admitting that these experiments have generally been conducted with pendulums which had little freedom of motion horizontally, we still think it odd that somebody did not stumble upon the curious fact. Though all parts of the earth complete their revolution in the same space of time, it is found that the rate of a horizontal motion in Foucault's pendulum varies with the latitude of the place where the experiment is made. At the pole, the pendulum would pass over 15 degrees an hour like the earth itself and complete its circuit in 24 hours. At Edinburgh, the pendulum would pass over 12 and a half degrees in an hour and would complete its revolution in 29 hours, 7 minutes. At Paris, the rate of motion is 11 degrees and 20 minutes per hour, and the revolution should be completed in 32 hours. Section 12, Figure 1. Let the above figure represent a portion of the Earth's surface near the North Pole. N supposes the pendulum to be set in motion at M, so as to vibrate in the direction of x, y, which coincides with that of the meridian line m, n has come in six hours into the position n, n. It has been hitherto supposed that the pendulum would now vibrate in the new direction of n, n, assumed by the meridian, but thanks to m, Foucault, we now know that this is a mistake. The pendulum will vibrate in a plane x, n, y parallel to its original plane at m as will be manifest if the plane of vibration points comes to some object in absolute space, such as a star. While the meridian line MN will in the course of 24 hours range round the whole circle of the heavens and point successively in the direction of NN 
or ON, or PN, then RN, SN, TN, and finally UN. The pendulum's plane of vibration, XY, whether at M, at N, at O, at P, R, S, T, or at U, will always be parallel to itself, pointing invariably to the same star. And were a circular table placed under the pendulum, its plane of vibration, while really stationary, would appear to perform a complete revolution. This stationary position of the plane of vibration at the pole seems to present little difficulty. We impress a peculiar motion of the pendulum in setting it a-going. The Earth is at the same time carrying the pendulum eastward, but at the pole the one motion will not interfere with the other. The only action of the Earth on the pendulum there is that of attracting it towards its own, the Earth's center. But this attraction is exactly in the plane of vibration and merely tends to continue with the oscillatory motion without disturbing it. It is otherwise if the experiment is made at some other point, say 20 degrees distant from the pole, supposing the vibrations to commence in the plane of the meridian, then as the tendency of the pendulum is to continue its vibrations in planes absolutely parallel to the original plane, it will be seen if we trace both motions that, while it is carried eastward with the Earth along a parallel of latitude, this tendency will operate to draw the plane of vibration away from a, quote, great circle into a small circle, that is, from a circle dividing the globe into two equal parts into one dividing it into two unequal parts. But the pendulum must necessarily move in a great circle, and hence to counteract its tendency to deviate into a small circle, a correctory movement is constantly going on, to which the lengthening of the period necessary to complete a revolution must be ascribed. At Edinburgh, period is about 29 hours. At Paris, 32 hours. At Cairo, it's 48. Calcutta, 63. At the equator, the period stretches out to infinity. M. Foucault's rule is that the angular space passed over by the pendulum at any latitude in a given time is equal to the angular motion of the Earth in the period, multiplied by the sine of the latitude. The angular motion of the Earth is 15 degrees per hour, and the latitude of 30, for example, the sine being the radius as 500 to 1000, the angular motion of the pendulum will consequently be 7.5 degrees per hour. It is therefore easily found. It follows that the motions of the pendulum may be employed in a rough way to indicate the latitude of a place. End quote. Notwithstanding the apparent certainty of these pendulum experiments, and the supposed exactitude of the conclusions deducible therefrom. Many of the same school of philosophy differed with each other, remained dissatisfied, and raised very serious objections to both the value of the experiments themselves and to the supposed proof which they furnished of the Earth's rotation. One writer in the Times newspaper of the period, who signs himself B.A.C., says, I have read the accounts of the Parisian experiment as they have appeared in many of our papers, and I must confess, this quote's coming from Supplement to the Manchester Examiner, May 24th, 1851, and must confess that I still remain convinced, unconvinced of the reality of the phenomenon. It appears to me that except at the pole where the point of suspension is immovable, no result can be obtained. In other cases, the shifting in, of the direction of passage through the lowest point that takes place during an excursion of the pendulum from that point in one direction and its return to it again will be exactly compensated by the corresponding shift in the contrary direction during the pendulum's excursion on the opposite side. Take a particular case. Suppose the pendulum in any latitude to be set oscillating in the meridian plane and to be started from the vertical towards the south. It is obvious that the wire by which it is suspended does not continue to describe a plane but a species of conoidal surface that when the pendulum has reached its extreme point in direction is to the southwest and that as the tangent plane to the described surface through the point of suspension necessarily contains the normal to the earth at the same point the pendulum on its return passes through the same point in the direction northeast now starting again from this point we have exactly the circumstances of the last case the primary plane being shifted slightly out of the meridian, when, therefore, the pendulum has reached, reached its extreme point of excursion. The direction of the wire is to the west of this plane, 
And when it returns to the vertical, the direction of passage through the lowest point is as much to the west of this plane as it was in the former case to the west of the meridian plane. But since it is now moving from north to south instead of south to north, as in the former case, its former deviation receives complete compensation and the primary plane returns again to the meridian when the whole process recurs." End quote. In Liverpool Mercury of May 23, 1851, the following letter appeared, quote, The supposed manifestation of the rotation of the Earth, the French, English, and European continental journals have given publicity to an experiment made in Paris with a pendulum, which experiment is said to have had the same results when made elsewhere. To the facts set forth, no contradiction has been given, and it is therefore to be hopeful that they are true. The correctness of the inferences drawn from the facts is another matter. The first position of these theorists is that a, in a complete vacuum beyond the sphere of the Earth's atmosphere, a pendulum will continue to oscillate in one and the same original plane. On that supposition, their whole theory is founded. In making this supposition, the fact is overlooked that there is no vibratory motion, unless through atmospheric resistance or by force opposing impulse. Perpetual progress in rectilinear motion may be imagined, as in the corpuscular theory of light, circular motion may also be found in the planetary systems, and parabolic and hyperbolic motions in those of comets. But vibration is artificial and of limited duration. No body in nature returns to the same road it went, unless artificially constrained to do so. The supposition of a permanent vibratory motion such as presumed in the theory advanced is unfounded in fact and absurd in idea, and the whole affair of this proclaimed discovery falls to the ground. It is what the French call a mystification, and Glees a humbug, end quote. Liverpool, 22nd, May, 1851. Another writer declared that he and others had made many experiments and had discovered that the plane of vibration had nothing whatever to do with the meridian longitude, nor with the Earth's motion, but followed the plane of the magnetic meridian. Quote, a scientific gentleman in Dundee recently tried a pendulum experiment, and he says that the pendulum is capable of showing the Earth's motion I regard as a gross delusion, but that it tends to, be, tends to the magnetic meridian I have found to be a fact. End quote. Liverpool Journal, May 17, 1851. In many cases, the experiments have not shown a change at all in the plane of oscillation of the pendulum. In others, the alteration in the plane of vibration has been the wrong direction, and very often the rate of variation has been altogether different to that which theory indicated. The following is a case in illustration. Quote, On Wednesday evening, the Reverend H. H. Jones, F.R.A.S., exhibited to the apparatus of Foucault to illustrate the diurnal rotation of the Earth in the library hall of the Manchester Athenaeum. The preparations were simple. A circle of chalk was drawn into the center of the floor, immediately under the arched skylight. The circle was exactly 360 inches in its circumference, every inch being intended to represent one degree according to a calculation Mr. Jones had made and which he produced at the Philosophical Society six weeks ago. The plane of oscillation of the pendulum would, at Manchester, diverge about one degree in five minutes, or perhaps very little less. He therefore drew his circle exactly 360 inches around and marked the inches on its circumference. The pendulum was hung from the skylight immediately over the center of the circle, at the point of suspension being 25 feet high. At that length of wire, it should require two and a half seconds to make each oscillation across the circle. The brazen ball, which at the end of a fine wire constituted the pendulum, was furnished with a point to enable the spectator to observe the more easily its course. A long line was drawn through the diameter of the circle, due north, and south, and the pendulum started so as to swing exactly along this line, to the westward of which, at intervals of three inches at the circumference, two other lines were drawn, passing through the center. According to the theory, the pendulum should diverge from its original line towards the west, and at the rate of one inch or degree in five minutes. This, however, Mr. Jones explained, was a perfection of accuracy only attainable in a vacuum and rarely could be approached where the pendulum had to pass through an atmosphere subject to disturbances. Besides, it was difficult to avoid giving it some slight lateral bias at starting. In order to obviate this as much as possible, the steel wire was as fine as would bear the weight, one-thirtieth of an inch thick, and 
the point of suspension was adjusted with delicate nicety. An iron bolt was screwed into the framework of the skylight. Into it, a brass nut was inserted. The wire passed through the nut, the hollow sides of which were ball-shaped in order to give it a fair play. And at the top, the wire ended in a globular piece, there being also a fine screw to keep it from slipping. Note, the pendulum was gently drawn up to one side at the southern end of the diametrical line and was attached by a thread to something near. When it hung quite still, the thread was burnt asunder, and the pendulum began to oscillate it to and fro across the circle. End note. Before it had been going on quite seven minutes, it had reached nearly the third degree towards the west, whereas it ought to have occupied a quarter of an hour getting thus far from its starting line, even making no allowance for the resistance of the atmosphere. End quote. Besides the irregularities of so often observed, the time and direction of the pendulum vibrations, and which are quite sufficient to render them worthless as evidence of the Earth's motion, the use which Newtonian astronomers made of the general fact that the plane of oscillation is variable was most unfair and illogical. It was proclaimed to the world as a visible proof of the Earth's di diurnal motion, but the motion was assumed to exist and then employed to explain the cause of the fact which was first called a proof of the thing assumed. A greater violation of the laws of investigation was never perpetrated. A greater violation of the laws of investigation has never been perpetrated. The whole subject as developed and applied by the theoretical philosophers is to the fullest degree unreasonable and absurd, not a jot or tittle better than the reasoning contained in the following letter. Previous quotes, Manchester and Examiner Supplement, May 24th, 1851. Better than the reasoning contained in the following letter. Sir, allow me to call your serious and polite attention to the extraordinary phenomenon demonstrating the rotation of the earth, which I at this present moment experience, and you yourself or anybody else, I have not the slightest doubt would be satisfied of under similar circumstances. Some skeptical and obstinate individuals may doubt that the Earth's motion is visible, but I say from personal observation is it, a, it is a positive fact. I don't care about latitude or longitude or vibratory pendulum revolving around the sign of a tangent on a spherical surface, nor axes, nor apsides, nor anything of the sort. That is all rubbish. All I know is I see the ceiling of this coffee room going round, I perceive this distinctly with the naked eye, only my sight has been sharpened by a slight stimulant. I write after my sixth go of brandy and water, whereof witness my hand, Swiggins, Goose and Gridhorn, May 5th, 1851. P.S. Why do two waiters come when I only call one? End quote. The whole matter is handled by the astronomical theorists is fully deserving of the ridicule implied in the above quotation from Punch. But because great ingenuity has been shewn and much thought and devotion manifested in connection with it and the general public thereby greatly deceived, it is necessary that the subject should be fairly and seriously examined. What are the facts? The above quote was from Punch, May 10th, 1851. What are the facts? First, when a pendulum constructed according to the plan of M. Foucault is allowed to vibrate, its plane of vibration is often variable, but not always. The variation, when it does occur, is not uniform, is not always the same in the same place, nor always the same either in its rate or velocity or in its direction. It cannot therefore be taken as evidence, for that which is inc inconstant cannot be used in favor or against any given pr proposition. It therefore is not evidence and proves nothing. Secondly, if the plane of vibration is observed to change, where is the connection between such change and the supposed motion of the Earth? What principle of reasoning guides the experimenter to the conclusion that it is the Earth which moves underneath the pendulum and not the pendulum which moves over the Earth? What logical right or necessity forces one conclusion in preference of the other? Thirdly, why was not the peculiar arrangement of the point of suspension of the pendulum specially considered? in regard to its possible influence upon the plane of oscillation. Was it not known, or was it overlooked, or was it, in the climax of theoretical revelry, ignored that a, quote, ball-and-socket joint 
is one which facilitates circular motion more readily than any other, and that a pendulum so suspended as was M. Foucault's could not, after passing over one arc of vibration, return to the same arc without there being many chances to one that its globular point of suspension would slightly turn or twist its bed, and therefore give the return or backward oscillation in a slight change of direction? Let the immediate cause of pendulum's liability to change its plane of vibration be traced, and it will be found not to have the slightest connection with the motion or non-motion of the surface over which it vibrates. At a recent meeting of the French Academy of Sciences, M. de Haute sent in a note stating that M. Foucault, whose experiments on the pendulum affected a few years ago at the Pantheon are of European notoriety, quote, is not the first discoverer of the fact that a plane of oscillation of the free pendulum is invariable, but that the honor of the discovery is due to Poinsonnet de Sivry, who in 1780 stated in a note to his translation of Pliny that a mariner's compass might be constructed without a magnet by making a pendulum and setting it in motion in a given direction, because, provided the motion were continually kept up, the pendulum would continue to oscillate in the same direction, no matter how many points or how often the ship might happen to change her course. End of section 12. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned and we'll see you back next time.